our hearts and minds for worship.
Let us worship God. Lord, we come here with lots of things on our minds, but now we turn our focus to you. Help us put aside our assignments and schedules. Replace our worry with peace. Guide us as we worship. Give us the ability to sing, pray, and learn more about you, O God. The Lord be with you. Living and gracious God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have brought us out to a spacious place where we are called to live as those redeemed. Empower us by your Spirit to keep your commandments, that we may show forth your love with gentle word and reverent deed to all your people. It is our nature to hide our faults. We want to cover up our wrongdoings to those around us so that they will only see the best 
the smartest, and the nicest parts of us. It's embarrassing that others know our shortcomings. As humiliating as it may be, we are assured that whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Together, we make known our, <clears throat> our faults so that we may find mercy as we confess. Lord, it's plain and simple. Our thoughts are not your thoughts, and our ways are different from your ways. Try as we may, we are unable to walk in perfect step with you. We put other things first. Our social lives, our to-do list, our addiction, our arrogance. And yet, you give us chance after chance to shape our thoughts and ways around you. Forgive us our misplaced priorities, O oh God. Shape our behavior and our lifestyles by the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ, that we might better follow you. Amen. We have taken time to admit some things that we want or need to change. A mistake, some guilt, a lie, the brokenness of it all. Something somehow has made us feel distant from God. But in Jesus Christ, we can be assured. We are not distant. We have been heard. We are loved, and we are forgiven. Just as God in Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also. Good morning, welcome to Westminster. We are so happy to have you all here worshiping with us on this beautiful Lord's Day. 
Um, you may notice that some things are a little bit different this morning. We have a lot going on today. It's a big day. Um, we have, today is Senior Sunday and Confirmation Sunday, which means that at 11 o'clock we will welcome 31 eighth graders into the life of this congregation and even baptize one. And the seniors will be leading worship at both 8.30 and 11 o'clock services. We invite you to join us in our ritual of friendship by signing and passing the friendship pads that can be found on the center aisle end of your pew. Note the names of those who are worshiping around you so that you can greet them by name at the close of worship today. If you feel a call to live out your discipleship in this congregation and have more questions about that, we would love to talk to you more. You can come down to the baptismal font here at the close of worship today where a member will greet you and answer any questions that you have about this congregation. A reminder that this morning's Sunday School class, led by Sue Tully Trout, will be held in the Koinonia Youth Cafe downstairs instead of the Fellowship Hall. And now I would like to invite Virginia Reynolds and Sarah Frederick up for a moment for mission. Good morning. Hey, Don Schulte, that's a fantastic pink tie you have on. Good morning. Hey there, how, are, how is everybody? How is everybody? Hey, I'm Sarah Frederick. And excuse us just a minute. Okay, what is wrong with you? This is not how we practice this. There's supposed to be energy, excitement. We're supposed to be extra. Game faces today. I know. So what's wrong? Well, where do I start? I've been traveling a lot lately for work. I'm trying to be a good wife. I'm trying to catch up with the Real Housewives of New York. And while making time to watch the Predators, I'm exhausted. Okay, I just need you to not think about that right now. I need you to focus. Okay, I can do that. So we're here this morning to talk about the Miss Martha's Ice Cream Social. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the afternoon of Sunday, June 11th at First Presbyterian Church. Yep and it supports the many wonderful programs at the Martha O'Brien Center that empower children and adults living in poverty. Yes, so why can't you get excited? I am, but all this talk with ice cream, I want some now. Well, why didn't you just say so? I happen to bring some of Amy Griffith's award-winning ice cream with me today. You know she won Best in Show two years ago with the Crankin'. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it is yummy. And do you know I bought some at Kroger the other day and it took all I had and I ate the entire container. So, do you think we should share? I think we should share while we sell tickets. So come see us after the service and buy tickets to Miss Martha's Ice Cream, Crankin' and Summer Social, Sunday, June 11th. Tickets are $10 for adults, $8 for children, and we need you to get excited with us about this event. <laughs> Let us continue to worship God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Holy One, fill our hearts and minds with your abiding peace. Quiet the busyness and anxieties that race in our minds. By the power of your Holy Spirit, speak as your word is proclaimed. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of God. 
Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their very cries on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Arabites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I to, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. In all my years as a member of this congregation, this has remained one of my favorite books and verses of the Bible. It's a part of the very timeline where in second grade, we first learned about this book and story by watching the movie, The Prince of Egypt in the film room upstairs and how almost three years ago, I was in a similar position as Moses was. I was on the choir trip headed to Canada from Newark Airport. There was this huge delay in our flight because this massive storm had canceled and delayed many flights that day. And I ended up getting completely separated from the group and having no idea where my gate was or where to even begin to, to look. Starting, I started to have a panic attack and then this, uh, the cutest adorable elderly man came and helped me and he escorted me to his own gate so I could calm down and we could find out where my plane was. Then the intercom voiced over us in that gate and told us to stay put because this special circumstance was involved in unloading a, a special passenger. I thought it was a celebrity, to be honest, but looking out, I saw something that was much more precious to me. I saw a group of, of soldiers unloading a coffin and giving it to his family that was outside the plane. They draped over the flag and prayers were said as they were coming up the boardwalk into the airport. I immediately reacted as Moses did. I hid my face because I was afraid to see any connection between God and a tragedy that he gave to this family. Suddenly, out of the storm, a little bit of sun shined on the old man who escorted me. He was actually standing and saluting the soldiers and the family. And then he went to go over to the coffin and he pulled a little poppy flower from his hat and placed it on top of the coffin. Later, as we were walking back, I, curiosity overtook me to be honest, I asked him, why he did that for the soldier. And he said he didn't do it just for him. He did it for the family. And he said something I would take with me from this moment on. He said he wanted to let the family know that the soldier's sacrifice won't take away the pain of loss, but it'll win, but it will win the bitterness. I mean, it will win the battle against bitterness that dims the light on all that is of true value in our lives. I realized later that I never asked for his name and I was sad about it because later when we were flying when we were flying through the storm and you get up above the clouds and it's nothing but sunlight 
I wanted to share it with him, and I wanted to thank him for what he said to me. I know now that the sun to me is not just a burning ball of gas in the sky, it's more like a burning bush to me, sending out rays of light and, one, and full of God's wonders in the world. And so I thank you, whoever escorted me in that airport that day.
The second scripture reading today comes from the book of Micah, chapter 6. I'm sorry, what? Is it on? Can you guys hear me? We're good? Hold up. Oh, my bad. Can you hear me now? All right, thank you. Sorry. I'm not good with the pen of mine. <laughs> the second scripture reading today comes from uh, the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. Hear the word of God. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The word of the Lord. I've always enjoyed the verses that just kind of sum it up for you. Jesus would eventually get it down from three bullet points to two. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. But he's Jesus, so we probably shouldn't be too hard on Micah. Honestly, this verse and a little bit of extrapolation could get you up to about a 75, 70, you know, on your reading quiz of the Bible. <laughs> hey, I forgot to read. What's the Bible about? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. Got it. Thanks. <laughs> Micah breaks it down to a to-do list. It makes you kind of wonder why people have spent so long spending their whole lives poring over the pages of the Bible when it's just kind of all right there. Just follow the instructions. Micah makes Christianity easy. Well, you can ask my parents, or better yet, you can ask anybody at the school across the road that is hopefully going to let me graduate pretty soon, fingers are crossed, but I'm not always the best at following directions. Obedience can be hard. Take a second look at Micah's instructions and you'll see that simplicity doesn't necessarily mean ease. Do justice. Fair enough. Better than fair. That seems incredible. Justice, fairness, that's a message I can totally get behind. I've got a long list of people I'd like to do some justice to. <laughs> and it'd be sweet, too. What, what better? How could it possibly be better? It is my Christian duty to yell at refs at high school football games. But Micah doesn't say enforce justice. He says do justice. I remember the last time me and my older brother ever fought. I think I was probably 12. He was 14. He was coming towards me, furious about something. I was terrified. He was probably right to be furious about whatever it was. But in my mind, there's roughly a two, one and a half percent chance this ended well for me. So I made the split second decision that there was no time for justice. It was time for a preemptive strike. One punch between the eyes. Before he even lifted his hands up, he was on the ground. So maybe justice isn't my calling after all. <laughs> Love kindness. Kindness I understand, but why do I have to love it? I remember one time, sophomore year, there was a group of us down at Holy Name Catholic Church cooking a lunch for a group of homeless people, and I, as a freshman, was on dish duty. They said something about small hands or better about it, but no one ever actually believed them on that. I didn't complain too much. I, I knew my place as a freshman. So I'm sitting there washing dishes, and. The dishes are coming in faster than I can wash them, so I'm letting them stack up on the windowsill in front of me until a homeless gentleman approaches me, sees the stack of dishes, and begins to scold me that I shouldn't let the dishes pile up in the window and shoves them in on me across the floor. You know, if you let them stack up like that, they could fall over, he tells me as I pick up dishes from the ground. <laughs> Thank you. What a shame that would be. The third or fourth time that he repeated this, I was getting a little frustrated. In that moment, I didn't exactly love kindness. Later, junior year, I found myself sitting in front of the NBA Honor Council for uh, forging a signature on my permission slip to go to Hands On Nashville Day. The irony, while I appreciated it, they did not like so much <laughs> on the NBA Honor Council. <laughs> Maybe it'd just be easier to avoid this whole kindness thing. <laughs> In that moment, I did not love kindness. So for those of you keeping track, do justice was a no-go. Love kindness was a little tougher than it sounded. 0 for 2. Walk humbly with your God. Well, this one should be easy. Clearly, I have plenty to be humble about. And yet somehow, 0 for 3. Every time I do a little justice, and I emphasize a little, or do a little kindness, my ego pops up and says, just take a break, look around a little bit. You're the best. No one loves kindness like you. 
No one does justice like you. Congratulations, you have arrived. Well, that's the dangerous thing about pride. It blinds us to our failings and tells us that it's not that bad, it gives us excuses and justifications, it sets the bar a little lower every time. So 0 for 3. While I've failed individually, and will no doubt continue to fail, this church right here has made me a big believer of the church, capital C. If you look closely at the sign outside, you'll see that Westminster Presbyterian gathers here. But I've been blessed to have grown up in a home where Westminster Presbyterian also gathers at Panera Bread in Boone, North Carolina, Boston, Massachusetts, James Sturkey's garage, most nights around my own dinner table. And when my parents gave me the Dietrich Bonhoeffer biography and I begrudgingly read it, I learned about his stand against Hitler, the power of a community to do justice in an unjust world and be agents of God, full well knowing the sacrifice that that entails. I learned that the church can do justice. Building wheelchair ramps on flood damaged houses and picking weeds in Boston so that someone could have a healthy meal and watching people sit and listen and share a meal at Room in the Inn, I saw that the church can love kindness. And every Sunday morning, a group of the most accomplished and successful, but more importantly, the most devoted and loving people that I have ever met, the congregation of this church, comes together to confess their failings in an attempt to grow closer to God. Every Sunday morning, I see a group of people come together to walk humbly with God. I will always be thankful for what I learned here. Thank you. the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Giving requires us to place something in the hands of someone else. When we give an offering, we place what we have into God's loving hands. Knowing this, we are asked to give freely, out of love, just as God did when we were given Jesus Christ. God gave out of love, so shall we.
friends, this is the table not of the church, but of Jesus Christ. It is made ready for all of those who love God and all those who wish to love God more. So come, you who have faith and you who have little. You who come here often and you who may not have been here for a long time or if ever. You who have tried to follow and all of us who have failed. Come, not because the church invites you, because it is Christ that invites you here. So come. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your great love for us and for the gift of this ordinary of meals made holy by your presence. We gather around this table and remember the old, old story, how your hands fashioned us with love, how we turned from you and sought other gods, how you continued to love us despite our disobedience, again and again seeking us out. Time and again you pledged to be our God. Time and again we failed to be your people. But you did not give up on us. In one of your great surprises, you took on our flesh, came to our earth, met us on our territory. So great is your love that it will not stop seeking us. Jesus Christ is proof of that. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the heavenly choirs and with the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. surprises, your spirit descended upon the people at Pentecost, filling them with gifts to spread your word throughout all the earth. So great is your grace that you will not stop calling us to be your people. The Holy Spirit is proof of that. So great is the mystery of our faith. So send us now your Holy Spirit. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down barriers that divide. Restore among us a love of the earth you created for our home. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Strengthen our congregation in its work and worship. Look with compassion on all who suffer. That united in your love, the church may confess your name. Share one baptism sit together at one table and serve you in one common ministry. God, who has met us in creation, in prophets, in written word, in God-made flesh, in the community of believers, meet us here again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of forever. We remember on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord gathered with his friends in the upper room, and he gave thanks and took the bread, blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
the same manner he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so whenever you eat of this bread or drink from this cup, you proclaim the death of our Lord until he comes. Friends, these are the gifts of God, and they are for us, the people of God.
Please join me in our prayer and litany of sending. And after I say, in gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you will respond with, go into the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us to your service. In gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go into the world. May you take the love and support of our church, striving to serve Christ in your daily tasks, daring to live boldly with eyes open for glimpses of God. When your voice seems small against the misery we hear, may you find the strength to sing in darkness. In gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go into the world. Hunger, greed, hopelessness prevail in our world, making it difficult to believe that God still dances. May you take off the blinders that shield your eyes from real-world struggles. In gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go into the world. Know that you are sent from this place to be the body of Christ. May you use the gifts you have and be surprised by the ones you have yet to find. In gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go into the world. The world is waiting to hear the promise of God, a life of justice, peace, and love for all of God's children. Through the uncertainty, may you listen to the voice of God, as loud as a crashing wave and as close as your own heartbeat. In gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go into the world. May you be blessed, may you be challenged, and above all, may you feel the love of God in all you do, knowing this church goes with you, supports you, and will always love you. In gratitude, empowered by the Holy Spirit, go into the world. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.